every other day, I like to go to the uh, exercise room at our apartment complex and uh, put in a, for my age, a fairly hard 45-minute workout in which my heart rate goes from my resting rate of about 64 or 65, and I try to get up as close to 120 as I can before I start bringing it back down. And usually, by the time it's all over, I'm able to get my heart rate back under, at least under 90. That's kind of my goal before I step off of the treadmill, is to be somewhere under 90 within that 45-minute period. So today happened to be the day that I was doing that at about 5.15 this morning. And while I was exercising, I had uh, the 100 most beloved hymns on my phone playing. And so the exercise was coming to an end and I was bringing, trying to get my heart rate down. And for the life of me, with seven or eight minutes to go, I was still not able to get my heart rate down below 90. That had never happened before. And I realized that in the midst of trying to get my heart rate down, I was singing with the choir the old rugged cross. And I said, well, well, dummy, you're, you're singing praises to the Lord and you're trying to get your heart rate down. That makes no sense whatsoever. So I am praying that today, as I always pray when, our, when we come together in fellowship, that it will be a real challenge to get our heart rates down as we discover all that God has for us today. Now, our lesson today, our, our passage, as Julie so beautifully read, and thank you, Julie, for that, begins with the words, for this reason, very similar to where we began last week. So, for this reason, I think, deserves to be experienced. And of course, we're basically going to be looking at a review of what we looked at last week. And so, these are the reasons that Paul is about to do what he is about to do. Number one, on the cross, Christ has made peace between Jews and Gentiles, and he has united us together as though we were only one person. Number two, Christ did away with any excuse whatsoever for interpersonal hatred of any stripe, but most especially bigotry based on ethnicity and national origin. Number three, Christ abolished the condemnation that we all faced under the law of Moses. And number four, Christ came and preached peace to the Gentiles, most of us, who were far from God and peace to Jews, like my granddaughter, who were near God. And because of Christ, all of us can now come to the Father by the same Spirit. So that's the reason that Paul is about to do and say what we're going to be looking at right after we pray. Father, once again, we come before you. We pray that all that we say, all the thoughts that are evoked, all of the feelings that may come about during this time would be focused and directed on these facts in evidence that we just presented. The incredible and wonderful news that all are one in Christ Jesus, that all can come boldly before the throne because of what Christ Jesus did on the cross. 
Father, we thank you for men like the Apostle Paul and so many others, such a wonderful, great cloud of witnesses, as your message in Hebrew says, that faithfully wrote and recorded all that you inspired them to do. And those faithful men and women over 2,000 years who have allowed your truth to wend its way to September 1st, 2024, here at Milford Bible Church. And we do give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and then there's a dash. When a dash comes, it's usually worth stopping and examining so far what's before that dash and what's going to come after. Well, Paul talks about the fact that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles. Well, we know from details that are mentioned in Acts 28 and from references that Paul made clear in other letters, we can surmise that this epistle was written during a two-year house arrest in Rome, probably around A.D. 62, which, by the way, during this time, he also wrote the epistles to the Colossians, Philippians, uh, and his friend Philemon. So this was a busy and productive time for Paul, which we're going to get into more detail a little later on in the message. But what's interesting about the beginning of this chapter 3 is verses 1 through 13, when Paul originally wrote this, it was one long sentence. Now, I want you to know, and you'll be happy that I decided against this, I really flirted with the idea of putting up there the diagramming of this sentence. I was all set to do it, I want you to know. But the Holy Spirit, in the form of a physical voice whose name I won't mention, said, probably not a good idea. Sorry, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> but it is one long sentence in the original. And what's even more astounding about this one long sentence is Paul begins with a thought. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and then there's that dash, because for the next 12 verses, Paul isn't going to talk about what he had originally planned to talk about for this reason. <laughs> Instead, and now he's certainly not going off on a tangent or a rabbit trail because obviously these words are inspired, what he does is based upon his realization that so many Gentiles have been added to the church at Ephesus during his three or so year absence, he feels the need to just kind of take this little detour and in verse 2 says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. In other words, because of the fact that he knew that these converts had been added, he feels the need to remind them of Paul's personal conversion and commissioning a counter with Christ on the road to Damascus as recorded in Acts 9, 1 through 7. And he continues in verse 3 saying, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. So, of course, I know you're wondering, well, when did Paul write about this briefly? Well, in a, as a matter of fact, we looked at it not too long ago in Ephesians 1, verses 7 through 9 is where Paul wrote about it briefly, where he said, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished, 
lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on in Ephesians 3, 4 and says, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So even though folks like Abraham and Moses and David and the Old Testament prophets had been given insight into the eventual advent of someone who would bring something wonderful to pass for all, Jews and Gentiles, the mystery had only recently been revealed to God's prophets, like John the Baptist, and apostles like Peter and Paul. Now, there is support for this idea in 1 Corinthians 2, 8 through 10, which says regarding this mystery being revealed by the Spirit, none of the rulers of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written... No eye, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. As it is written, more often than not, means we can find where it's written, not always, but most of the time, back in the Old Testament. And in fact, these wonderful words were written in Isaiah 64 and verse 4. And then in 1 Corinthians, Paul goes on to say, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The Spirit searches everything everything, and I may be so bold to add everyone, every heart, every motive, every initiative. I'm trying to bring my heart rate down now thinking about that. Regarding the prophets and apostles, let's revisit Ephesians 2.20 for just a moment in which Paul says that it is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And what a wonderful message that will be someday when we talk about Christ as the cornerstone and what all that means. Now, Ephesians 3, 6 then goes on to say, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, I am praying that that idea is pretty familiar to you in as much that's what we spent most of last Sunday talking about. So you will be pleased to know that I feel no need to expound upon that any further. Beginning in verse 7 of Ephesians 3, we discover just how instrumental Paul will be in his imprisonment beginning in verse 7 of Ephesians 3. Of this gospel, he says, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Again, Damascus Road, Acts 9. Verse 8, to me, 
though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, that declaration that he is the very least of the saints is by no means any kind of false humility. Paul is well aware of his present sin and even more aware of the sin under which he persecuted at one time the saints of the living God. So I certainly find a lesson in that if Paul considers himself the very least of the saints, I can't even begin to imagine how low I must be and I invite you to imagine the same thing about yourself. Acts 9, 15, God is talking to Ananias who is in fear of meeting with Paul based upon Paul's former activities and reputation. And in Acts 9, 15, it says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Paul is reminding the Ephesians that he really and truly is God's chosen instrument to the Gentiles and to the Jews as well. And he continues in Ephesians 3 verse 9 with, and to bring the light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And once again, I believe that we covered that concept in depth last week. No need to revisit it again. But now verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, this is an interesting assertion here, an interesting idea that God's manifold wisdom is going to make no, be made known now to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. To put that in simple English, one of the things going on here is God's giving the angels a little bit of a lesson in his manifold wisdom. That's what it says, basically. And we get to eavesdrop on that lesson. So the manifold wisdom of God, manifold, manifold. What does manifold mean? And where, oh, where would I go to find the definition of a word? How about Webster's 1828? And I hope that when I'm done reading verbatim what Webster says about the word manifold, that it'll be impossible for you to bring your heart rate down for the rest of the message. This is what Webster writes. Of diverse kinds, many in number, multiplied. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. Psalm, CIV, 104. It happens to be 104, verse 24a. I know your manifold transgressions. Amos, V, 5. In fact, chapter 5, verse 12a. Second definition. Exhibited or appearing at diverse times or in diverse ways, applied to words in the singular number 
as the manifold wisdom of God or his manifold grace. Now, here's the cool part. The manifold grace part is cited from 1 Peter IV. In other words, 4. In fact, it's 1 Peter 4.10. The manifold wisdom of God in Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the American Language is taken from Ephesians III. In other words, Ephesians 3.10. All I can say is III. I am so tempted to go down the rabbit trail of how God is living in all times and in all places, and he knew that this was going to happen 196 years ago when it all happened, but I'm going to resist that temptation. But we are going to talk some about the rulers and authorities in heavenly places that Paul is mentioning here. Well, in 1 Peter 1.12, regarding the Old Testament prophets, this is what it says. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So this is Peter now on the same theme as Paul, making it clear that as the Old Testament prophets were speaking then to them back then, it is God's plan and intention that they are speaking equally well and clearly to us in the here and now, and that not only is this good stuff for you human beings, for we human beings to hear, this is good stuff for the angels to absorb as well. Psalm 148, 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Revelation 7, 11. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Revelation 19, verses 1 and 6. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty, reigns. I guess those powers and principalities in heaven have some kind of a vested interest in this beautiful revelation as well as do we. My ESV study Bible note on Ephesians 3.10 says this, God's redemptive purposes are of interest to angels and the whole host of heaven who are better able to glorify God when they behold in wonder what God has done in creating the church. The angels apparently behold in wonder what God has done in creating the church. We know, and the reference escapes me now, but we know that when one who is lost has been found, there is rejoicing in heaven. And then in Ephesians 3, verse 11, Beginning in verse 11, verses 11 and 12, Paul has this to say. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, 
in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. And once again, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know that I feel like we covered this pretty well last week as well, and so there is no need to belabor this wonderful news at this time any further. And so Paul closes this particular passage with verse 13 of Ephesians 3, where he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. In 2 Corinthians 1, 6, Paul said it this way, if we are afflicted, we, Paul referring to himself and others who may be with him, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we endure. Paul speaking to the saints 2,000 years ago, brothers and sisters, he's speaking to us today. Our comfort comes when we experience and patiently endure the sufferings that have been suffered by God's children over two millennia and will continue so until the Lion of Judah returns in glory and victory. And in Colossians 1, the first part of 24a, Paul simply says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I'm going to ask the men to come forward at this time for communion as I finish my remarks. That word prisoner that was applied to Paul is the word desmios, and it means one who is bound, shackled, impeded, or disabled. One of my favorite authors, and um, uh, for many reasons, not the least of which is I really do appreciate and admire uh, those who are descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who have had the courage and the wisdom to understand that the Old Testament prophets were, in fact, pointing to one Jesus of Nazareth, who is now Jesus the Christ. And Jonathan Kahn, in his Book of Mysteries, on day 274, says this. And this, by the way, is in regard to Ephesians 3. It was as a desmios that Paul who would minister to millions of lives throughout the ages, Paul refused to be defined by any circumstance, hindered by any impediment, or limited by any set of walls. He knew that no chain can bind the will of God. Therefore, if we live our lives to the fullest of God's will, we will live unshackled and unstoppable. And now Jesus the Christ invites us to freely and unshackled come before his table of remembrance, all those who know him as Lord and Savior.